Hey everyone, thank you for joining us online here at Destiny. If you haven't had a chance to visit our campus, we would love for you to come out and join us for our 1030 service. But if you can't, you can always watch us online at destinyokc.com. And while you're there, you can watch any of our past messages, see any of our upcoming events, or read pastor's vlogs. Also, don't forget to follow us on all of our social media platforms right here. And now, here's this week's message. Listen to that. There's something so um, beautiful about the stillness of a moment. And man, we live in a busy world who doesn't understand that. And we're about to be introduced to that in a, a unique way. In fact, um, I'll, I'll be sharing about this in a bit, but I'm going to if I can get this out without falling off of here, that would be great. I've been exploring a little experiment. And I've uh, filled this jar with dirty water. And it's been still now for a little while. And uh, the dirt has all settled to the bottom. And... It's interesting, but you and I are made from dirt. You do realize that. And so the illustration, you know, as I've reflected, this has been sitting in my house for this past week, and I just keep looking at the clarity of that water. And um, I just think of the be clear-minded and self-controlled so you can pray. How many of you know we need to keep our flesh in control, <laughs> under control? Uh, self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. And it's important that we have a clear mind in the process of uh, what that really looks like. And this doesn't happen if you're just constantly spun up and stirred up about every circumstance that's going on in your life. How many of you have had something unexpected, difficult, frustration, disappointment, whatever happened within the last 10 days? And when those things happen, then we kind of take that and we just kind of get spun up. And I mean, the flesh just gets all interaction with our way of thinking, and it's amazing, but by the time I'm finished today, that will start to settle back down. But, but the, the reality is, you and I, and I would encourage you, by the way, I would encourage every one of you to get a jar and do this and put it somewhere in your house, just so you can see that settled uh, dirt as a reminder for what we're going to begin talking about and focusing on for months together. Today, I'm going to introduce to you um, maybe from a, a little deeper perspective, uh, some of our conversation about Sabbath and what that really means. <clears throat> uh, we've had a lot of conversations in our household and our family. In fact, just to be quite honest, we've had a few spirited conversations about this um, because this is just not easy. But the Lord really is going to help us um, engage in a deeper understanding of what his kingdom is all about and what his, her, his word has to say, even if the culture we live in fights against it. How many of you know the culture you and I live in fight against the word of God? I mean, when you start talking about sexuality, the word of God has one narrative, the world has an entirely different narrative. Would you agree? The same thing with busyness and rest. And so we need the Lord to work within us, giving us the desire and the power to do what pleases him, to do what serves his purpose as well. And so we want to step into that and go deeper in that, and we're going to uh, venture into that today. I want to encourage you to know part of that is really being true to the word. I'm going to give you a couple of ideas of how to just take time in the word and actually not just read the word. It's great to read the word, and I'm thankful for um, you know, turn the page, and I've had a number of people talking with me in the last couple of weeks that this year is a year they're going to really commit to that. Some have never done it before, uh, and I've encouraged you in that. I'll talk more about that next week, what that really looks like, but it's just being in the Word, but also just taking time not just to read the Word, but actually study to show yourself approved, the Bible says. How I many of you these things just take time? And so we have to learn to spend time with God if we're going to have a deeper relationship with God. Just like we have to learn to spend time with each other if we're going to have a deeper relationship with each other. In a fast-paced, busy society, we have all kinds of connections, but very few true relationships. And uh, I, I really believe the Lord wants to help us with that. So part of what we're doing in this season is we're introducing a study, a Bible study uh, for the church family in the book of Ephesians. And Pastor A.T. 
will be uh, start, uh, launching that this evening at 5 p.m. online. And he'll share a little bit of that as we close today. So um, just kind of hang in there and he'll give you the details. But that's going to be a Zoom call. We'll break out into groups and have interaction, I believe, in the way that's going to work. We're just going to study through the book of Ephesians and take some time together in the Word for an hour on Sunday night for a season of time, 5 o'clock. We're focusing in on 40 days. Happy New Year. Uh, it's 2024. And um, I'm glad you're here. And we're really believing that this is going to be a, a wonderful, wonderful year. God has a great plan for 2024. How many of you know? There'll be challenges in the course of the year. Let's just be real honest and understanding about that. But there is no challenge that we cannot more than conquer because that's just who we are. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And so we want to, um, this year, come into the year and really develop that foundation very uh, powerfully. So, the, you know, we bring a 40-day focus coming into the 2024 year. And in that emphasis, what, basically what we're doing is just trying to develop a foundation for the year where we're really going to give ourselves to pursuing the Lord, loving God, loving others, and doing what Jesus has asked us to do uh, according to his word. Uh, I, I would ask you just to begin thinking about praying about, this is a little unusual, February the 4th, the first Sunday of February. We're nearing the conclusion of 40 days. We have the opportunity on February 4th to host an event. There's a ministry that we're very closely associated with, uh, and they have been traveling around for the last year doing worship nights all over the state of Oklahoma. God put it in Pastor Cody Anderson's heart that he's to go and awaken the fire of God all over the state of Oklahoma. One of those events happened here, and some of you all uh, attended that event this last year. And, um, and ultimately what's happening now on February the 4th, all those locations all over the state of Oklahoma are converging here for one final worship night on that February 4th in unity. It's a unified effort to declare, Lord, let the fire of God be awakened in the state of Oklahoma. Um, just in that kind of that, that moment of applause, you know, the scriptures are just so beautiful when the Bible talks about, uh, Job actually says, I will clap my hands and hiss the enemy away so come on can we just join together everybody let's just clap our hands and declare we call forth god's will god's plan god's word god's presence in the mighty name of jesus There's just something uh, about the prescription that we find in the Bible for worship that actually produces a release of God's kingdom to advance in the earth. Uh, you know, David danced and the presence of God returned. Uh, the Israelites shout and the walls come tumbling down. Uh, uh, Moses holds his hands up and as long as his hands are held up, uh, the victory is upon the people of God. So there's something about when we come together and we lift up our hands, we're releasing that champion spirit of the victorious risen king in circumstances. There's something about clapping our hands and shouting, this bringing down walls that need to be torn down and destroyed that are holding some people back, but today those walls are broken. There's something about our dance that just releases and brings back a sense of God's presence. I mean, it's a beautiful prescription that we see throughout the Word of God. And so what we're trying to do, particularly in the first 40 days of the year, is to lay a foundation of a deeper pursuit where we're kind of setting in tone, setting uh, in motion those things that will set the tone for uh, that place of just an, uh, a greater awakening in all of our hearts. How many of you hope you are deeper in your relationship with the Lord one year from today? Can I just see? You know what I say when I ask that question? Anybody say it with me? Hope is not a strategy. So what we want to do is introduce practices to help you get there. We've been talking every year uh, for years now about kind of the five central ideas that we know that the Lord has told us is to be a centerpiece for who we are as a family. In fact, we've, we've kind of made it into a, a phrase and that's going to pop up. We're going to read that together. The first one always has to begin with God, with love. So we are outrageously loving people. So let's say this all together. Would you join me? We are outrageously loving people who passionately pursue the Lord with irrationally giving lifestyles as we consistently submit to God's desires and effectively disciple others to do the same. 
It's a beautiful declaration. You might take a picture of it with your phone before it disappears just to have it, rehearse it, think about it, ponder it, reflect it. But I want you to understand those five core values this year, we're introducing not only core values but core practices. We really hope that um, when we're together as a family, we will, because of our worship to the Lord and the, the pursuit of God and His Word, that we will become outrageously loving people. Not just loving people, outrageously loving people. How many of you here uh, want to be an outrageously loving person? I mean, I want to be. And, and here's the thing, this is what we're trying to maneuver, is that we recognize it's almost futile. You're going to have to listen to the whole phrase or you may you know, shred your, your clothing and run out shouting blasphemy. So listen to the whole phrase before you call me, you know, whatever you want to call me. Um, but it, it's really not enough for us to convince you to try to be an outrageously loving person. How many of you know trying to be an outrageously loving person can be very frustrating? I mean, you just got to try harder. Is, is that really the case? Like, you got to try harder. This is what we're going to learn as we start to walk this out. This is not about trying to be an outrageously loving per person. This is about training to be an outrageously loving person. Like, I know there are a few of you that have run marathons. You didn't just wake up on that morning and you heard there's a marathon. And you thought, I'm going to try to run a marathon today. How many of you would pass out? Uh, and so you don't just get up and try to go run a marathon. You have to train to run a marathon. Everybody can train to accomplish something. When you try to accomplish something and you're not equipped to do so, it just increases your frustration and you start saying, well, I'm going to try harder. And then that enhances your frustration even more. So I didn't, we're going we're gonna to try to really get this concept in our hearts and in our minds as the Lord begins to introduce this. And I just sense he's here helping lead us into this. But we want to alleviate you from trying and empower you for training. And actually it becomes the result of training in the practices that you produce the principles that we're celebrating and talking about. How's that sound? Sounds like a bunch of hot air, doesn't it? Unless you can give me some practices that are going to help, then uh, I'm just going to stay spun up. But what we're going to do is just learn to be at peace. Learn to be at rest. Um, the best version of you is the version at rest. In fact... Um, you're most like yourself. Think about this. You are most like yourself, like the person God created you to truly be. You're most like yourself when you enter a state of rest. A framework, a mindset of rest. How many of you have uh, made some really bad statements before? Like you said something you regretted in a moment's time. Okay, that'd be everybody. You don't have to raise your hand. It's a rhetorical question because that's an everybody question. And, and I promise you, when you think back to the times that you were the most unloving, the least gracious, it was because you were stressed out, in a hurry, focused, and all you were just so spun up on everything. You were not in this state of mind. You were in this state of mind. And you, I mean, hurry is an enemy to love. <laughs> So if we're going to learn to be outrageously loving people, then we need to embrace some ideas of what these practices are all about. And these are practices that we find modeled in the life of Christ. Are you a follower of Jesus? If you're a follower of Jesus, say amen. amen. We know Jesus came, he lived, he died, he's risen from the grave. I'm so thankful we can believe in our hearts, confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, and we'll be saved. Can I get another amen? Amen. It's a beautiful truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but I challenge you to consider if you're following Jesus, your life should resemble his life. It's shocking to me how many people say they follow Jesus, but their life doesn't resemble his at all. So we need to evaluate what those practices were in his life and pursue those practices as we follow his example. And in those practices, we find ourselves training to be more like Christ, not trying, training. So it's just a beautiful picture of how to walk this out 
Um, and truthfully, the church has grown weary with sitting still. The church has grown weary with hearing sermons because saying something is one thing, but doing something is another. And it's time the church moves from saying to doing. What we say is still equally as important as it has always been, and the principles have to be true, and the Word of God needs to be open, and we need to constantly be people of His Word, understanding what His Word has to say. It all is born from here, but then there has to be action because faith without works is dead. Principles without practice is dead. So we want to embrace that and walk that out um, as we truly answer and fulfill the Great Commission. So turn with me in the last chapter of the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28. Therefore, go... I mean, right there up front, the Great Commission is an actionable expression. Do you, you hear it? It's not just believe. That's the problem. We've made the gospel into that which we're supposed to believe. And believing is vitally important. I'm not in any way saying what we believe isn't important. It's vitally important. But if what we believe isn't impacting how we behave, then the question is, do we really believe what we think or say that we believe? Therefore, go. Go and do what? Make disciples of all nations can we say all those phrases to get just those words right there therefore go make disciples of all nations okay we just pause there for a moment because we need to understand making disciple first begins with being discipled jesus is the disciple maker in the room you realize that He's still making disciples today. And what we have to learn to do is make the connection between our own heart and God's heart. And he then begins to awaken this within us. So you must be a disciple. And then after you become a disciple, then you start to multiply yourself and make disciples. This begins first in your heart, then in your home. And we are believing that uh, God is working in our homes, giving our family the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Philippians 2.13, I encourage you to take that verse and pray that verse. Pray it over your own heart. Pray it over every family member. Pray it over every co-worker. Pray it over your five-foot circle. Pray it over people that might call themselves your enemy because God can melt the situation and turn that scenario around. God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Allow the Lord to do this work in your heart. Let the Lord do this work in your home, in your five-foot circle, in our community, in our city, in our nation, and in the nations of the world. And I, I just want to encourage you to know, you'll hear more about these details, but we are this year aiming our sights on reaching into nations of the world. And so I just want to voice my appreciation, Randy and Megan. Uh, raise your hand so everybody knows who I'm talking about. Just appreciate the Lincolns and their heart. They've been missionaries all over the world, and now they're here with us, and we're so thankful that they are. And they're going to help set things in motion for some mission trips even this year. Here's some trips that are coming up. You can scan the QR code if you want to get a little bit of information on it. But uh, we're going to be looking at, in May, the Philipp uh, Philippines, <laughs> the book of Philippians, the, the Philippines, uh, Rio de Janeiro. I mean, you can see the progression into Mexico, Africa. Uh, those are four trips that we're aiming for this year. They can help you with what that looks like in terms of fundraising, preparation, uh, learning to speak Rio de Janeiro, uh, all those things. Uh, we'll, we're going to try and make this as relatable and and, um, and I, I want to say easy, but how many of you know the kingdom of God is about some sacrifice? We shouldn't just be talking about the sacrifice of Jesus as the only sacrifice in the room. And we want to learn to walk this thing out together, make disciples. My heart being um, completely surrendered to the Lord. My home, a place where the atmosphere of God's kingdom is being established. My family and family from there beyond and outward. So notice this is so important. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them, say it with me, 
to obey. That is such an important phrase that's absolutely overlooked, undervalued. If I read it without it, people don't know it. I've done this in other churches, and I've, I've said the Great Commission, leaving that out. Teaching them everything I have commanded seems to be just sufficient, and you don't even notice that to obey has you know, been extracted out. But this is the actionable expression. We actually are not just supposed to teach principles. We're to teach practices. We're not just supposed to teach principles. We're to teach practices. Teaching them to obey. You've you got to understand this. Like I'm going to harp on this a little bit because we have to have a sense of conviction that God is asking us to do more than just believe principles. He's calling us to actually walk out and implement practices. If you were walking with Jesus today, he wouldn't say, listen, I just want you to believe what I believe. He would say, I want you to walk where I walk. I want you to feel what I feel. I want you to learn to say what I say. I want you to become the expression of who I am. The practices of Jesus' life would be implemented into your life. Teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So... These are the practices. You're most like yourself when you learn to live in the state of rest. You're most like yourself, more in communion with God, more uh, available to love those around you. When you're stressed out on your last nerve, it's hard to be compassionate and loving. I have... <laughs> I mean, it's been a busy season. Would you agree? Trey, uh, Faith, our, our oldest, has this app for her car insurance. Anybody have this? I'm finding out this is a thing. And if you, uh, you know, log in on that app and you stay logged in, then it tracks you where you go. And if you uh, stop too fast, it'll alert you. Or if, you, you know, if you're driving in any way that's a question, it will alert you. And if you can drive without your app alerting, then you get a discount on your insurance. And so Faith was very excited about this. She's a very good driver. And, and we're, she's riding with me somewhere. And her app keeps dinging her. <laughs> and she says, Dad, you're going to make my rates go up. And she keeps on having to put something that says, I'm not driving, I'm the rider. The, the someone else responsible for this. And, and I, I mean, I'm just, I'm just trying to get somewhere because I've got places to go. I've got people to see. I've got things to do. Has anybody been there? And like when you're doing all those things and you're here, this is more what you are like. I've got stuff to do. <laughs> and your flesh is all caught up in your way of thinking. You're not clear-minded at all. All you're doing is driving to some conclusion to get this thing done, and people are just in the way. When actually, those are the people you're supposed to love. Uh, I've wrestled with this, but it's not on the notes back there. But you might just uh, write down Colossians 1, 20 and following. This is one of the verses I've been memorizing recently, just reflecting on it. This is Jesus making peace by the blood of his cross. Man, that really hit me when I was reading it one day. Jesus making peace by the blood of his cross rescued us. You and I were alienated, it says, verse 21, hostile in mind. Do you understand? Before you were a Christian, if you have accepted Christ, you've not just gone from you know, not being a Christian to becoming a Christian. The Bible describes before you know Jesus Christ, you are an enemy to God. Do you understand that? This is a big deal that you understand this. This isn't just becoming a little better. This is being completely transformed to be a different person. 
You were an absolute enemy to God. And what did Jesus do to, to reach you? He made peace by his blood on his cross. That means he absorbed your hostility. He absorbed your hatefulness. He absorbed your enmity. He absorbed your deception. He absorbed your immaturity. He absorbed your insecurity. He absorbed it. He took it in himself and nailed it to a cross and killed it there. Do you understand? This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what I want to challenge you as I'm looking at what it means to be an outrageously loving person because I'm not sure I'm able to do this very well, but I'm going to become better, not to try harder, but to train better because I want to be around people and whenever their immaturity starts to show up or insecurity starts to show up or their hatefulness starts to show up or their criticism starts to show up, I want to be able to absorb that into myself and let it die there so that I'm following the example of Christ and contributing to an atmosphere of God's kingdom in my world everywhere I go, bringing God's presence to real life. I'm not saying I'm good at this, but I'm saying I want to get good at this. I want to practice some things that will help me train to become everything God's called me to become. And in doing so, it makes my world a better place. And hateful people around me and insecure people around me and critical people around me, people that are attacking me, people that have horrible things to say, they might even be coming to the point of saying, crucify him, and I'm still willing to die even for those people. We are outrageously loving people. Now the stakes have gotten high. I've gone over the line, haven't I? Being nicer than I used to be. Now I can do that. No, I'm saying you're going to have to die to yourself to become everything God's called you to become. And you cannot die to yourself until you learn what it is to get in the presence of God and take time for him to settle your thoughts and cause you to become the best version, the original version he ever created you to be in the first place. In the garden, in exchange and relationship with the Lord your God, unbroken fellowship with the heavenly father no matter what anybody's doing around me i'm in relationship with him no matter how many voices are screaming for my attention no matter how many situations seem to be so alarming the bible says be self-controlled and alert not self-controlled and alarmed self-controlled and alert so that you can be in the state of prayer That's Colossians 1.20. We'll probably address that quite a lot in weeks and months ahead. Whew. Wow. Okay, let's just talk a little bit about the practices because we're, we're uh, drawing to a place where we need to hit those practice ideas before we walk out of here today. Everybody doing okay? I feel rushed, so I'm slowing down. We probably all need to put that into practice. Sabbath is not a legalistic requirement. You need to understand we're talking about Sabbath because ultimately um, there are core values and now we're introducing core practices. And so if you could pop those core practices up, I know I've totally messed you up in terms of progression. I'm not even sure where I am in the progression of notes, but... Um, where the, the, that is what you see there are five core values on the right, the heart, outrageously loving, the Bible, passionately pursuing. You see the progression of that. So the first thing we want to look at to be outrageously loving people, there are two practices that we believe that we as a church family should be implementing in order to become everything God's called us to become. Sabbath is one of those, and service is another. Specifically, we'll talk about this in just a few moments, but this is anonymous service. Anonymous service. Acts of service that we don't brag about or get credit for, but we're actually serving others as unto the Lord. But you actually won't really serve others well until you first learn to be in the presence of the Lord. And that's why Sabbath is such an important practice. And it's so important, you'll see it all the way at the bottom as well. It's, we're starting with Sabbath and we're ending with Sabbath on these five weeks of focus because it is such an important principle. Do you know the Bible says that you should not commit adultery? How many of you know that's true? 
It's one of the Ten Commandments, so we would know that one, right? The, the, honoring the Sabbath is one of the Ten Commandments. Like, it's just so neglected, but it is one of the big ten. And so we need to explore this. And, and again, this is not an issue of a legalistic re requirement, but it is something that we need to understand. God has actually implemented something of a law that he has designed to exist within all of his creation to produce something that will not be produced if we neglect the reality of God's design. The absence of Sabbath reveals the presence of self-sufficiency. The absence of Sabbath reveals the presence of self-sufficiency. When your yes becomes more powerful, I'm sorry, when your no becomes more regular, your yes becomes more powerful. How many of you know that's true? When your no becomes more regular, you kind of know more about who you truly are. Then your yes becomes more powerful. So Sabbath is actually a way to live more deeply in God. Sabbath is just this space where we create to live more deeply in God. So it's an ambiguous term. Let me give you uh, some ideas. This is all in the blog, by the way, and all the, all the, the sermon today that I didn't preach because I'm lost my mind up here. I'm just saying, Lord, I hope this just doesn't totally flop right now. Uh, just give us some sense of understanding and practice as we walk out of here. I want to give you these principles of Sabbath. And these aren't like rules. These aren't the things that you have to do, but these are things that characterize what a Sabbath truly is, okay? First, we understand that a true Sabbath, uh, according to Jewish culture, would take place on Friday evening at sundown. There'd be no work. Um, and, and then, you know, Saturday evening, uh, sundown, Sabbath is over. Well, let me just say, this is going to be different for every person, in my opinion. Uh, you need to determine what this is going to look like in your life. Wouldn't it be beautiful if the church actually surrounded people in our community to help them, like a single parent who just can't seem to make a Sabbath work with the schedule because of the way it is, and the, the community of the church surrounded them to actually give them the opportunity to have a Sabbath, worked with them to make sure that they actually could do what God tells us to do in the Word. I just think that would be a beautiful reality of we as the body of Christ saying, this is so important, we want to make sure our whole church family has the opportunity to participate in this. So for us, our, our Sabbath, and we're talking about all of this, but, but Saturday evening we want to have a meal, and on that we're picking Saturday evening because we want worship to be a part of our Sabbath expression, and we're going to sit down at a Saturday evening meal, and we're going to light a candle, and that candle just signifies it's begun. It's just a consecrated moment, something that becomes a sacred idea in our brain. When that candle is lit, then it has begun. We're having a meal together. We're going to have our Bibles at the table. And we're going to be talking about where we've been reading and what we're sensing. And that's going to be kind of the launch into. And we're not going to do a bunch of work, no laundry on Saturday night. How many of you know you should not be doing laundry on Saturday night anyway? I mean, that just ought to be a rule somewhere. But uh, you know why laundry is such a problem? Because the fall of the garden created us the need to have clothing like we didn't ever have, we should have never had that it's just the part of the curse and so anyway no no laundry uh no dishes you know well dishes whatever you have to do again it's not legalism but it's just saying my rhythm is going to be different and so saturday night the candles lit for us maybe music will play we might play boards uh, games or something we're going to try and avoid digital interaction you know things that are filling our imagination um, uh, as much as possible and just devote that time to the lord so here are some characteristics that you would find and how you would do this you know you'll have to tool this out but lighting candles is a very common uh, part of this this picture Blessing children, joining together and just praying a prayer of blessing as a result of initiating this Sabbath. Eating a Sabbath meal. Taking time to express gratitude. All these are on the blog. You can look at them. Uh, singing songs together. Worship. What does that look like in a home? Most of us don't know. We only know what it looks like to come here and enter into worship. But it can become a beautiful thing in, in your home. Worshiping with your community. Taking a walk. Taking a nap. 
making love to your spouse if that has not happened that week. It's important to consummate a marriage relationship as unto the Lord. These are just common characteristics of uh, when we're looking at the overall perspective and the narrative of a Sabbath. Reading Scripture together, spending time alone with God, spending time with family and friends. I mean, relational things. I want to go deeper with God, and I want to go deeper with the people who matter in my life. How many of you think that could be a really beautiful thing? How many of you would agree that's going to look different in every person's life? The last thing we want to do is to come up with the thing everybody has to do. That is not what we're after in this. But if we're going to be outrageously loving people, then we're going to have to learn how to practice this sense of solitude and Sabbath where the flesh is brought under subjection. Sabbath is not only entering in to a war with the busy world around us saying, I'll not participate in the busyness of the world system. Sabbath is entering into a war with the busyness of my own soul. And I'm saying, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. I will bless his holy name. Okay, the second uh, practice that we're introducing is that practice of service or anonymous service. And this just involves your five-foot circle, doing things for people without trying to make it known. They, they'll know at times. But if you can do it secretly, great. But just the point is you're not doing something for somebody to let them know you're doing it. It's service. This is outrageously loving people. If you want to really implement practice to become and train to become an outrageously loving person, first, you calm yourself to become more of who God designed you to become. And out of that, then you become automatically, naturally, a more loving person. So look for those opportunities. Your schedule's not totally in charge of your life. And you are in charge of your schedule, and you're going to make room and space. And so every single week, find somebody to make sure you are blessing. This is a practice. What we're doing is not trying to be outrageously loving. We're training to be outrageously loving. How many of you think you could bless somebody once a week? I mean, within your five-foot circle, everywhere you go, bring God's presence to real life and just offer some form of sacrificial anonymous service in any way that you possibly can. I'll ask if the worship team would go ahead and come back up. Having such a good time, I just may keep on going for a while. I, you know, what I feel like has happened is the Lord has like opened up um, a doorway of a practical application that's about to release a spiritual power in our personal lives. And here we are in a room, and, and much of what we're talking about is really practical application. But, you know, we've, what we're doing is we're learning um, new language for ideas God's introducing to the body of Christ. And, and in doing so, then we find some of our old language makes more sense. Anybody remember maybe three years ago, I started introducing this concept, and I said, church has been like going to the movies and it needs to be like going to the gym like instead of showing up to be entertained we should show up to get engaged and work and work out like i see that now with a whole lot more clarity that we're on this side of what the lord's doing in the church so what we don't want to do is show up and have entertainment what we do want to do is come together and have encounter that then we carry out and we walk that out in our everyday lives. But this requires sacrifice on your part. I thought it was interesting. Uh, the more God's Word reiterates an idea, the more times we see it mentioned in Scripture, right? And so the word pray is mentioned 371 times in Scripture, depending on your translation, but 371 times. The word love is mentioned 714 times. So I'll pray for you is a great thing to say, but we're told to love two times as much as we're told to pray. So pray for them and then love them. Like this is taking us from concept to action. But here's the thing that got me. Pray 371 times, love 714 times, give 2,152 times. 
And what we're seeing is actually the Bible is trying to reiterate for us what it looks like to actually put love into practice. And that requires something sacrificial. And let me just say, it's not the topic of the day, but giving has always been a part of worship from God's very beginning of the plan. And this concept of the tithe, where every time I increase, I bring tithe to the storehouse and I release something of God's kingdom in, in finance, actually what that does is it breaks materialism off of your life. You stop living under the bondage of materialism, and this is a part of God's plan for worship. That begins to unlock something in your life of a sacrificial disposition and just generosity in the way I'm going to choose to live. Sabbath and service. How many of you want to be an outrageously loving person? Say amen. I don't want you to try harder. I want you to train harder. Sabbath and service. We've got five weeks to talk about practices from each week. If you got one of these cards, those practices are all listed on it. There are probably more of these back there available. But you cannot go deep if you do not slow down. And I believe the Lord is wanting us to slow down for the purpose of going deep. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to evaluate this with me? Walk this out a little bit and just ask the Lord for some wisdom and guidance. <laughs> I hear the arguments in your head because I've had the arguments in my own. How am I supposed to do this? It's the wrong question. How do I fit this Sabbath into my busy schedule is the wrong question. Here's the right question. What is the purpose of Sabbath? That's the right question. And when you figure that out, then you know how to apply it. Lord, forgive us for arguing against your word. We argue because our sexuality might not line up with what we read in the Bible. We argue because sometimes it's easier to lie than it is to tell the truth. We argue because we're just so busy. What in the world could Sabbath even be in the modern day time? Forgive us for arguing. Forgiveness comes when we repent. So if you need to repent for arguing with the cross of Jesus Christ, the Word of God, in any area of your life, just lift your, both your hands and surrender. Maybe this is Sabbath, maybe this is sexuality, maybe this is giving, maybe this is whatever it may be. You've found yourself arguing with the reality of God's Word. Just put your hands in this posture of surrender. We just surrender those things to you. Lord, we're, we're putting into action what we were singing about earlier and we say your way is better our way is inferior your way is superior forgive us Lord where we have argued against your word forgive us where we have argued against the cross of Christ forgive us for the arguments that the Bible actually calls strongholds that exists within us that are trying to war against what we're hearing right now that you're desiring to reveal. Forgive us for that, Lord, we pray. Help us to become more of who you have designed us to become as we surrender to the reality of your word. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You came, you lived, and your life matters. The practices of your life set the model for us to follow. But after you lived on this earth, you died on a cross. You absorbed our hate and our hostility within yourself and you nailed it dead to a cross. And then you were raised from the grave to prove to all the world you truly are who you say you are. You're the savior of the world. 
Come on, just in agreement for who he is, let's give the Lord Jesus Christ a standing ovation. Would you join me in that? We just say, Lord, you are worthy of our praise. You are alive. We want to walk with you. In Jesus' mighty name. teams are going to be available if you would make your way up. We're just going to press in for a few moments and pray. We're going to give you some details on the church-wide Bible study just as soon as we're concluded here. So hang in there and let's just press in and go just a little deeper. Take whatever the Lord's stirring in your heart, whatever you're sensing, and just bring that back to Him and say, Lord, help shape within me what you're desiring. I just want you to know God is working in you right now, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Do you understand that? I want you to know God is working in you right now, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. So come on, just cooperate with that just for a few moments uh, as we worship. And if we can pray with you about anything at all, if today you've surrendered to Christ for the first time, please come, let us pray with you and make sure you have a Bible in your hand. If, if we can agree with you for uh, God to do a deep work in your life, in your heart, in any area, or somebody you want us to pray for, that's what our prayer teams are here for. We're available. So as we just press in and worship for a few more moments, our prayer teams are available. Come on, let's go just a little deeper in the Lord.